So yeah, look, at it, just a brief introduction. Um, I suppose a lot, you know, a few people different reasons, but how I got started in this was meeting, you know, just good interest interested people in, in, in soils and environment over the years, Neil Fuller and then Gary Zimmer. And two of the key messages I took from Gary were, one was you have to earn the right, because an awful lot of people, I suppose, who are looking at biological farming, they want, well, can we use less of this? Can we use less nitrogen? Can we use less fungicide? And really, it was probably to save a bit of money. Uh, and he, he has a great statement, you know, you have to earn the right. You have to learn how to cut back on those inputs. And that, that's critical. That means self-management. And the second thing he taught me was don't make a religion out of anything. So there's no rules. We, we tend to work on very few rules. You, you, you get out there yourself, plenty of farmers and advisors and people. You have your own brain. So go out and have, have a go at it. But um, So, yeah, that's just a bit of background. I suppose we're working. We work with farmers mostly through agri merchants or advisors and uh, we do a bit of trail work and so look at the farming comes last but anyway um so what's biological farming you know people talk about organic biological regenerative organic who really cares they're all just names you know whatever suits yourself up our country we say a crooked loaf is a straight belly so try and get stuck in with it and get something going uh, because you know you can get fixated on this and we definitely don't want any arguments or rows but look at I suppose a couple of simple things it's working in harmony with nature copy how she works you know feeding soils and soil life that comes down to sometimes things like fertilizer choice so we try and encourage people to look at more organics and composted manures opening your mind to new ideas is probably the biggest challenge we have getting growers to, and look, sometimes peer pressure can be part of that and I know Fiona in our new role in Chagas is going to be a real help against that because you know she'll start to put some bit of body in there now that, that, that there's a bit of research going on in it so um, and be kind to soils and you know I suppose we used to say that to people and they think we were crazy especially the few devils that knew me because in my day there'd be no queen of the land here at half ten in the morning giving a speech that's all I can tell you but uh, and it's interesting with Gary Zimmer when he did he came over to visit us a few years ago and we did a series of biological meetings when nobody really knew what biological farming was and you know we thought he was he, he was really one of the leaders in it but uh, we started in the meeting in Cork and we walked away up and the first meeting we ran we had two people plus myself and himself in the room but uh, we finished up in County Loud where I suppose we were more, more used to dealing with people and working some of these systems and it was a packed house but he discovered uh, today we you know you'll hear people talking there's plenty of trade stands products and systems but he, he discovered a new biostimulant, an Irish biostimulant called Irish coffee. So he, he can tell you a bit about that one himself later on. But anyway, uh, so embrace biodiversity. That's really a big one coming now. Crops and animals, whether it's in your soils or crops or your animals. Systems approach versus individual components. That's probably the most, really the most important uh, angle to it. There, there's no individual component. And it's probably going to be one of the hardest things in this research. Because you can start to research mycorrhizae. You can start to research pseudomonas or, or airworms. And they don't really work as individuals. Mother Nature doesn't work like that. She works as a team. Uh, growing more roots is one of the simplest things we've ever said to farmers. If you can grow more roots, you'll end up getting some level of success, whether it's working soil or improved drainage or improving nitrogen use efficiency or fertilizer use efficiency. So the most important tool we have is a seed that grows into a plant, and it's probably one of the cheapest. So farmers don't need to spend a lot of money. So I suppose Sean said to me, look at... Uh, how are you going to fare, you know, is there any of this going on out there? And we said, yeah, bits and pieces around the country. And, uh, you know, what's the story? You have to buy expensive equipment to get into it because he probably was thinking things like, you know, no-till drills and things like that. We said, yeah, well, actually, one of the most expensive pieces of equipment is a spade. So uh, most farmers don't do it. And when I started going out on fields 15, 20 years ago with a spade, we were actually made little of. And some of the people who made little of me that him now actually, you know, they've got bigger spades than me. And, and, and they tell me that. So uh, size is everything with spades. Dig a few holes, and this is what we say to farmers. Educate yourselves, get out there. You don't need, you know, look at great, you need an advisor, we need, we're all part of a team. But really and truly, this is about self-education. So, you know, start off maybe with someone that can show you a few things. Just get out, dig a few holes. Count the worms is probably one of the simplest things we can do as regards checking soil health. Checking for compaction, is there a plough pan in grassland, is there a compaction layer where the, the cows or the sheep or the cattle are really packing it down. See how big and deep your roots are. If they are moving, if you've got a big root mass, you, you know, you're, you're, there's, there's some level of a healthy soil there. Smell the soil, open your mind. That takes a bit of, you know, everyone gets a bit weird with that one, but uh, you start it, you'll start to notice differences. Open your mind, that's, that's probably one of the key things. Think differently and be willing to make mistakes. Peer pressure probably has stopped a lot of this taking off over the last 20 years. 
you know, I was talking to him last night and he said I should be doing this. Oh no, I wouldn't be doing that. I was talking to her or him and they said, no, that's a load of bollocks. And, and that's what happens. Like, there's no point saying any different. But anyway, uh, management skills, decision making skills and self accountability become really important because to be fair to the advisory services, whether they're private or, or, or state and, and the agri merchant trade, in a lot of cases, people want that advice that if there's a problem to have somebody to blame. And, and that's one of the negatives of it. So in, in biological farming, you probably are going to find less and less people to blame. You, but, but you'll enjoy it more by becoming more educated yourselves. And that self-accountability is a big one. This, this, and I'll, I'll give a few examples later of farmers making decisions for themselves. And, and they are risk managers really now, you know. Look, learn and copy from nature. The big one here is biomimicry. So what, what does nature do? And can we copy that? And can we make it work for modern agriculture? So nature doesn't work as a monoculture, and she does not leave soil bare. So that's a good starting indication for us that we should try and at least bypass some of those things that's happening at the moment. It's really suitable for all types of farming enterprises. And I just advise people, try a small amount, 1%, 2%, 5%. Don't go wild. If you do 100% of the farm, you could go broke in the first year. But if you do 5% a year, you learn over the first three or four years, and all of a sudden it makes more sense. When I say all types of farming, and we, you know, we come in contact through the work we do with big intensive tillage farmers, intensive dairy farmers, extensive farmers, tillage, livestock, veg, um, you know, organics, and everyone has different ways of looking at things and different requirements and different questions and probably different roles for us on the farm. And really and truly, it's just do something, try something, pick a few ideas out of this conference. Most people go to conferences, that's a great idea, that's great, I'm going to do something, go home and life gets busy again and they just don't do something. So pick, if it's only buy a spade and go dig a few holes, that's probably a great starting point. Definitely don't aim for perfect because it's unachievable, but good is good. You know, and a lot of people wait for the perfect soil test. I know there was a question earlier. There is no, forget about that. Just, you'll find as soils improve, you won't, you know, we're probably, my fear is we're going to analyze soil microbiology to death now. And, and it'll be turned into a, some sort of a business, which, which it shouldn't be because it's still nature. We can improve it a little if we look after it. If you go to war with nature, you will lose. We're seeing that regular at the moment. We've got serious issues in tillage production with septoria resistance, insect resistance. If you look at the grassland situation, there is a problem with the amount of nitrogen being used, even though it's still probably compared to some countries were pretty much in a slightly better place. But we're getting problems with water pollution and things like that. And that's not, that the pro Fiona mentioned that those pressures are coming from government level and it's not going to stop. So if you go to war with nature, you're going to lose. This is one thing we tell farmers, pooch. Again, we've got farmers and advisors, you know. So keep pooching, keep asking the questions. Educate yourself. Definitely challenge the status quo. You know, disagree with me, disagree with James, whoever. Because it's only by teasing some of those things out. We always say in our country, if you can ask three whys, it's a good man will answer the second one. Very few can answer a third why. And that's when you, you really get the measure of a fellow or, or, or an advisor, or whatever you want to put it. So you can think for yourself and definitely believe in that. You know, belief is, is one of the big ones. Ask lots of whys, just mention that. Walk your fields, you have to get back out. I, I, I'm not great in some of these quotes because I don't know whether some of the ones on the internet are true, but anyway, Albert Einstein, look closely into nature and everything will become clearer. And we'll see a little bit of that later on. So symptoms be the cause. The last 40 years has probably been, in, in some ways, a successful agriculture and farmers were doing well going back, we say, from this, coming from the 70s into the EU and production. And I, I think the connection to that has been we've lost organic matter, we've lost the heart of soils. That's been the biggest detriment I've seen over the years. And secondly has been the the major push on the levels of nitrogen being used to grow crops. So I think, you know, quite simply, we're not going to go back to really old, old ways of production, but, you know, the intensification of farming still here. But I think we could probably do better if we could get back to the types of soil we had 100, 200, 300 years ago. So again, it's going back to those septoria resistance issues and insect insect. You know, developing a new chemical just because they're be that's not really what nature's telling us that you won't, you know, you're not going to beat me. So we have to try and find out why are, why are we getting septoria on this crop of wheat? Why are we getting uh, insects on, 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 on crops, what, veg and things like that? So here's the early days of cover cropping, and this is a little story, very funny. This is about 12 years ago, and uh, we've grown cover crops on our own farm for a good few years, and a local potato and cereal farmer, I said to him, you should be trying these cover crops, you should be trying these cover crops, you, you know, great job, great job, doing a bit of business with them on, on soil and crop nutrition, 
And he did sow a cover crop uh, in a field, he had a bit of land he had taken in, uh, away from the house so no one would see it. And he rang me one day and he said, Robbie, I want to look at this cover crop. And I knew on the phone he wasn't in good form. So I said, what's wrong? You, you don't sound in great form. Oh, neighbour said to me down there, what, what, what's that shite crop of oats you have out there? What's going on out there? And he'd be a real proud man. He'd be a good, good, good farm, you know, good, would have produced good crops. And I said, well, look, we'll go and we'll have a look at it. Come, I'll meet you in the yard. We'll go down with the spade. We'll have a look. And when I got into the jeep, and normally me and him would have a good bit of banter, he was very quiet. And I said, here, I'll go for one more. I said, why didn't you just tell that man that Robbie Bourne told you to put in the cover crop? Oh, fuck, oh, hey, Robbie, he'd definitely tell me I was mad then if I mentioned your name. So anyway, <laughs> but we went down to the field. We went down to the field, stuck in the spade in two places. And look, he turned around and he says, I've seen enough. And that man's cover crop went away like good old. Right, we run into an odd wee issue with slugs. But look at this, and we're talking about soil biology. That's, that look at the size of the oats. They weren't in very long. And that's not a headland. We just went into the field, and I was blessed. The guy who did the work for me broadcast the oats, hired out a drill, a disc, sorry, went down and disc it in. And he happened to run out of seed and left about one third of the field not done. So we exactly to the line in that field. And that's a really old phone. There was no smartphones then. And I definitely wasn't in, 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 in able to work smartphones anyway. But look, look at the tightness of this. Look at the looseness. I know the slide, sorry, it's a real old photo. But if you saw that up close, it's amazing. And that's roots. And it's going back to those eggs that Joel spoke about this morning. Now, here's the thing we look at with soil testing. If you go, there's soil, you test that. It's index 3 for P and K. It could be pH 6.5. It's the same field. Which would you rather have? So that's, that's part of why we're starting to say, look at other things in, in soil. We need to look at other things. And definitely the spade is very, two, two shovelfuls, I've seen enough, and he's cover cropping pretty much up on two to 300 acres a year now between different crops, cereals and potatoes. And actually his comment on the potatoes is, he's saving money on diesel and wear and tear on steel. So environmentally, that's a plus. He's, it's a plus for him, he's spending a bit less money. And hopefully this year is going to make a good bit of money out of spots. But anyway, uh, so here's another. I'm, I'm a member of BASE, which is a, an Irish organisation set up a number of years ago. Biodiversity, Agriculture, Soils and Environment. A group of farmers and a few advisors really trying to have a look at this from a whole different angle. Is there something we can do differently? This BASE member's in the audience there. A great innovative farmer, not afraid to take a risk. Has, is basically making decisions for himself and, and talking to people and getting some handle on a little bit of advice. So this was an example of a summer, what we call a, a summer cover crop. Part of the field was sown the 20th of June because it was actually a, 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 a sort of a, a wet hole. And the rest was sown the 25th of July after winter barley. So he burned it off on the 28th of September and the cover crop was sunflower, facelia, buckwheat, linseed and there was a bag of maize thrown in there over 20 acres. So that's a good multi-species. So basically, come to the 2021st of October, he burned it off, come to the 2021st of October, he's now broadcasting oats, which is going to be his companion crop, and then he drills beans on the 28th of October, which is just a little over two weeks ago. So, it's just to show you what guys are doing. This is another example of cover, well, originally cover cropping, intercropping now, companion cropping in the Northeast. So it's beans with oats. So that's the first, first example of them there, about a month after sowing, come to the 21st of May, starts to get a bit nervous, will the oats take over, we had a chat about it, no worries, you know, wh easy to whip it out with a bit of graminicide, starts to look into his crops, you know, there's bits of volunteer issues with volunteer buckwheat and, and really provide no, no hassle, but it's something you just need to be aware of, sorry, just to go back on that, that guy is doing without a pre-emergence herbicide now. So all these things are fitting in and they're addressing. So if, if, if the consumer demand is eventually, and I'm not saying fungicides and herbicides are bad, but if the consumer demand is telling us that they want less chemicals on food, these are systems that's actually already been used to help reach that type of a target. This is an advisor in the Northeast who, who's an ag chem sales rep, and himself, when he heard and saw what we were doing in other farms, he took it on himself and went off and tried this. He didn't even tell me. But he rang me to sh show me the picture. So that's basically companion winter oilseed rape with phacelia and vetch as companion crops. And again, reduced herbicide by 35% of what he'd normally be selling to a, a client. And in his words to me was, I'd rather have a client that's now profitable, that's fit to pay his bills and be working, because this system's coming, this, you know, a, a slight natural system's on the way. So Jill Clapperton was over again. We've had a lot of speakers in over the last 10 or 15 years. I'm delighted to meet Sean McLean and he can take the responsibility of it now. And, Cover, co cover the costs and, and do, do, do some of the, the, the trips and around. But uh, 
Yeah, the, basically, Jill Clapperton was the first person I ever heard saying, you know, comp companion cropping in grass and in, in these things will actually lead to an improvement in yield. So, and we see it here, just a, a brief slide of hers. When you start to put in the, what they call a cocktail mixture, the yield, the biomass goes up, the yield goes up. And, you know, that's been proven then in, 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 in the UCD work on that uh, multi-species sward trial. Lambs hitting growth rates 25 days earlier. And in fairness, one of the big things, I suppose, because of the, 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 the issues around worm resistance is this 50% reduction in, 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 in the need for chemical doses to control, control uh, worms. Yeah, so that's a company in England, Cotswold Seeds, very innovative. We've been dealing with them a long, long time. They just, you know, they, they deal direct with, with, with farmers on the ground. And, uh, but they've been putting a lot of work in for the last 20, 30 years on this type of stuff, way, way be before anyone else had even thought of it. And if there was such a thing as a Nobel Prize for agriculture, they probably should deserve one. So again, if you go on their website, you can pull off some of those. This is an, a machine we took in from America to do farm demos a number of years ago. It was designed by the USDA Conservation Unit to show farmers about the damage that soil erosion and runoff can, can do to their, to their farms, their soils, and the environment going into the water and into the, to the rivers. And just the one point I want to say is that's actually forest soil, and it's basically a little coppice round home. And the thing to, to notice is it's, it's not, again, that's a cover crop. That's actually, there's less soil in that than that. There's less water. So it's slowing down the flow of water, and it's also slowing down the loss of soil because of those exits those roots are putting out. That's the real interesting one, and that's why I say I think the biggest damage over the last 50, 60, 70 years has been the loss of organic matter, humus, I know maybe just fancier terms for it, I don't know, out of these soils we're farming. And I think, you know, when you talk to some of the father, grandfathers, they were talking about decent enough yields pre all the modern genetics and all the modern uh, yield lifts that we've got decent yields when they were ploughing, because there was a good rotation, and in a lot of cases you were ploughing up sort of reasonably fresh virgin soil. But that's a big drop in water. That water's in there. That forest soil is holding it. That organic matter, that humus is actually holding that water. So we're looking at things here, and I, I think that's a, a key fact. That's another little similar machine. It's a tabletop uh, rainfall simulator. And the difference here is that's actually a no-till soil, no-till winter barley, plough-till so winter barley. Same farmer either side of, of, of a ditch. Uh, he's, in, you know, he's been transitioning to, to no-till for a number of years, uh, min-till initially, and he's just trying to, and, but if you can see there, do you see that bottom dark bit? That's all soil. It's not there. And we don't set those up to, to, to win. We just, we, we stick those two things in the ground in different fields and we, we run the little trial. Again, back to Martin from Cooley. This was part of a biological conference in Cooley a number of years ago. That's Rick, uh, sorry, that's Bud Davis, the USDA conservation man who came over to, to help us set up the rainfall simulator. This is a thing called a slate test, very easy to do. Um, tip into your local secondary school, I'm sure the chemistry lab will have a few of them laying around, get, get, get someone to lift a few. And uh, this is no-till soil, and that's plough-till so soil on the, on, the, on, on the left there. And again, what can you see? A lot clearer water. Now, that's not compacted. You know, people say, oh, that's because it's compacted. That's far from compacted but it's showing the benefits, and they're just simple little things, and I'm not, you know, I'm not saying they're, they're, they're all, all things to all men, but it helps to show people in a very clear fashion. We'd hope to think in the next few years that farmers can be paid for some of this, because I think at the moment it's, it's tough being a farmer, and, and this cheap food policy around the world is not working out, for definitely not for farmers. Root mass is a key part of successful biological farming. You know, very important. That's a mycorrhiza plus a biological consortium as a seed dressing on potatoes and what we call dreadlock roots, you know, holding on to all the exits are sticking to this soil, keeping it there. Um, nutrient root mass. That was a foliar trial we just on farm uh, a number of years ago. And, you know, big increase in root mass and some bit of increase in tillering. That's index four for P, index three for K. And, you know, he produces good yields, that tillage farmer. Now, sorry, again, just a biological seed dressing versus none. You know, and again, look, they don't always work. Guys, try them out, have a go, have a look at them. And that's, uh, I thought Joel was from New Zealand, but I only found he's from Australia, so we're gonna say, well, we're definitely gonna give the All Blacks a good kick in next Saturday, so uh, we, we'll take it from there. But this fella, this, this young farmer heard uh, Bud Davis mentioned that, you know, the, 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 root, the, the shoot growth of grass mimics what's going on in the roots. And he went off and did his own trial, I didn't even know this. And he appeared to me about three weeks later and showed me this. And he was cutting this every day. And he, he didn't cut that at all. And, and I suppose it's clearer here. 
So, and I know at the moment, you know, it's hard to fit that into a workable system. If you're a dairy farmer, you have to let the you know, cows are grazing on rotation. But nitrogen is probably growing as a lot of grass that actually root mass, uh, can, uh, it's grown as a lot of grass, but it's probably shortening our root mass, which is leading to some of this compaction we're seeing on dairy farms. Again, I'm not sure where that slide came from, but it's, it sort of tells the story in, in a little bit more science than, than my pictures. So again, look at some of the questions we get asked, do you do any trials? Yeah, we have Irish farm trials, which look, I don't know, you know we'd like farmers to do some trials themselves. Uh, we've looked at chicken manure pellets, manures, organic manures. We recommend a lot of organic manure to farmers to get started and then top up with chemical fertilizer. Cover crops, humids with fertilizers, liquid seed with fertilizers, mycorrhiza, consortiums of biology, and trichoderma, you know, nitrogen fixers. And foliars on dairy farms, we think, is something that's really interesting. We're seeing some nice results from that. Replicated trials. Over the years, we were lucky enough to start off our first ever replicated trials with a famous man, Jerry Board, a great man of the soil. And uh, who sadly passed away a number of years ago. We've done work with UCD, Donald Dilwart, um, Chagas, DKIT, Queen's University, and the University of Nottingham. As well as looking at yield, we look at plant health parameters and, and this immune system within the plant, nutrient density, antioxidant levels, and protein content. We think that's a key one. We think Irish farmers should be able to grow higher protein wheat with better amino acids profiles, but get paid more to put it into a ration. And we'd like to see more of it going into dairy rations, James. <laughs> not the 30% yield increases, depending on crop. We've had years where we get, you know, pretty much 3 to 4% of a yield increase would be average. And, you know, it's, you know, we try and be honest with our trial results. But in saying that, we sometimes get some, some quite special ones. Look at, again, going back to the farm grass trials, we're looking at fresh grass yield increases from 11 to 50%. Uh, quality parameter variations. It's harder with the dairy grass with the protein. Sometimes you can drive the protein up too much. But we're looking at true protein as opposed to funny protein. So we don't want to see it going out the back end as watery mush. Um, calcium, boron, copper, selenium, iodine, filigree, seaweed, magnesium. We've done a lot with sulfur. We've done a lot with seawater, uh, bits of sodium, compost teas. We've tried lots of things. And yeah, some you know, varying success and failure. Compaction's a real big one on grass. And it, it needs it needs a, a lot more uh, attention. What can we learn from animals? The, the simple one here. That's the same field, um, sheep farm, in 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 the northeast. And the difference here is so they actually like this bucket more than this bucket. But this bucket's got seaweed in it. So that's not poaching. That's actually this one doesn't get moved maybe once every week. That has to be moved every two days. So it's just to show you what animals can tell us. And you know one of the things we like to tell farmers is they love ivy. You know, and we, we go and we test ivy, and it's amazing when you see that nutritional profile in ivy. It doesn't actually put out a lot of nitrogen, but it put out, puts out a lot of calcium, zinc, sulfur, things like that, that they are looking for. So foliar feeding the grass, you know, that's just some of the, some of the visuals what we're starting to hit with making nitrogen more efficient. And uh, there's a, another gentleman in the audience, David Atherton, a great cowman. And uh, I robbed this slide from him because it's just showing the benefits of composted manure. We think most manure, farmyard manure should go out as some form of composting to try and tie in and stabilise that nitrogen. And we start to see this, and I know other speakers over the next two days will talk about less weeds with this composted manure. So again, some of David's work is tied in with mineral nutrition and balancing minerals because we find it's a, actually a lot of it's about balancing you know, whether it's soils or, or, or microbes or, or, or nutrition and that. So potassium ion and molybdenum are the three big ones that we see as the bully boys in, in silage and affecting how, it, how the cow accesses important nutrients like calcium, magnesium, sodium, and, and some of the fertility ones. And, you know, zinc for hoof care, um, copper for, for fertility, sil going, back, you know, going back in heat, selenium, iodine. Just wanted to talk briefly about carbon fertilizers. Uh, you know, this is a, a quite an intensive farm in the northeast. Uh, he was, you know, very intensive, no problem putting on whatever he's allowed, plus a bit, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining. But, uh, you know, we work on this, most chemical fertilizers are just NPK, whereas when you start to look at, he uses com com mushroom compost, layers hen manure, and in places where he can't get, you know, he, he, he started using chicken manure pellets, which we've done some trial work on and we're quite happy with them. You know, I think it's, it's, it's a very interesting product and showing great results. But w when you start to get into the organics and you look at something like the pellets, you, NPK, calcium, sulfur, carbon, magnesium, zinc, copper, boron, manganese, it's, it's got lots more stuff in it that's feeding soil life, feeding soil bugs, and hopefully encouraging 
a, a better soil after three or four years application. And you can't buy carbon in humus. That's the thing we're, we're saying to farmers. Microbe and airborne food. So again, this is some of the cereal trials. I just put this up because it's a humic acid and it's quite topical at the moment. We find we get good results with it on potatoes. We don't really get good results with it on cereals. But, uh, you know, so increases in saleable yield. And that's probably over three years. Uh, and we've looked at the nutrient density. I know there's a bit of chat about nutrient. And one of the ones we're always looking for is this calcium. So treated versus untreated, we're getting a doubling of the calcium in there. And that, that's interesting to us. That's a trial that was done in Holland this year. I just stuck it up because Fiona mentioned climate. And uh, the way we looked at it, that's, so that's the feed, that's untreated. It's again going back to a humic acid product. 25 litres, 50 and 100. Like, I know, sorry, it's a little bit unclear, but there's a lot more um, leaf mass here. And it's going back to that slide I showed you with the forest soil. I'm not saying the solution's in a can, no more than the ag chems are saying it. We have to build our soils to do these jobs for us. But this, this demonstrates what we're missing in soil. So that was the same drought hit that field, you know, because it was a pretty big field over four, four areas. So it wasn't, it wasn't really, it's not just that this bit was watered or in a wetter spot. Same drought over there. Some of the work we've done on wheats has been looking at foliar sulfurs. Basically, no... no um, no I chem, just looking at what, what plays around it. So, you know, sulfur's doing a good job, both yield and plant health, copper, boron, things like that. This Jerry Board's trial in 2010 was probably some of the most successful results we've ever had. We've had a, lot, a lot less since that over the years, average and as I said, around three or four percent. But the interesting thing here, I suppose, is products like boron with molybdenum, sulfurs, and the interesting thing for us here was we have two types of sulfur. And one type went down at three litres per hectare, that went down at two litres per hectare. Twice the yield response from this one in the crop replicated statistically different. The interesting thing was, when we analyzed the protein, there was 1% more protein in this. This did not influence protein content in the grain whatsoever. Even though we're told the higher the yield, you'll dilute the protein, this was actually higher protein. So there's a lot more things going on. We're only scratching the surface, folks. We're only scratching the surface with soil biology and mineral nutrition, both in crops and animals. Uh, Jerry did some trials on with mycorrhizae at the time on spring barley and, and potatoes and you know reasonably good results. It, it, it's not really a big thing around the country, there's very few people using it and again sometimes you get mixed results but in fairness we said we'd have a look at it at that stage and that's gone back eight years or nine years at this stage. So what does a farmer really do? That's the same field with and without sulphur. Said to the farmer one, did you see a difference? No. Go out and pull two flag leaves and come back to me. Crisscross them and look at the difference. Far dark or green. So again go back to what Joel was talking about. So. This basically a farmer's taking, uh, taking free sunlight, carbon dioxide and water and turning it into something he can sell. And this is about managing that system in there. So again, we're looking at chlorophyll management to increase yield, hopefully, and sell it. And then we're looking at natural disease resistance. And now that particular farm was actually mixing different varieties of wheat with a view to taking down uh, the disease pressure in there. And again, just going back to that conference in Carlingford, I didn't say it, Martin, we had co cover crop plot trials in and we had a monoculture of oats, and then we had a mixed couple of different species. So uh, when, when we analyzed that, there was no mildew in the, in the mixed species. There was way, you know, full of mildew in the monoculture. So sorry. Again, just looking at different nutrition, looking at nutrition and disease resistance. The calcium, the silica is on the leaf skin, the magnesium and the sulfur in the plant microbes. So soil analysis, just briefly, um, if, you know, a basics fine to get you started and then start looking at some of these other things surely but i think what's happening in soils visually is far more important one of the things we do send out to farmers and that's i suppose one of the limitations of this index system in in some ways and some of the strengths of it is what's the difference so here's index four that is index two and that's on the same farm the same field we did the variable rate soil sample on that and it showed up like that we like to educate farmers so we send out Mulder's chart to show people this is the different interactions. Elaine Ingham soil food web slide is something similar. Uh, it just shows you that all this is connected. Variable rate lime on dairy farms we think is, is, is quite an interesting one. The W pattern would probably show that up at about 5.96 and give it a ton and a half, whatever lime. Whereas when we split it in two, four acre paddock, two acres, two acres, this needs t twice the lime that this needs. So again, and the Chagas research has shown that lime is vital for getting soils producing this organic nitrogen and helping to reduce chemical nitrogen usage. pH definitely is influenced by calcium, magnesium, potash and, and sodium, not just calcium. Uh, most soils in Ireland we are fine dominating with that. So leaf and sap analysis, just to double check, what we're finding with the leaf and the sap analysis is mostly they're excessive in nitrogen and mostly deficient in magnesium and boron. 
nitrogen can be quite a bully. Driving yield is one thing, so we look at other, so it may not be short of zinc, but do we need zinc to help the plant deal with virus a bit better? Again, balance is the key. Uh, now, this is the airborne saga. So airborne numbers are a great simple indicator of healthy soils, and I think that's the way of it. That fella there's getting coolie patchy, and you can't beat it. Look at the size of him. He loves it. But basically, the way, the way we run on this is that if you actually look at air pumps and what to do, they're borrowing, they're draining, they're pulling residue down into the soil, they're building soil structure, they're secreting little secretions that are feeding bugs. Every, once the soil passes through their body, it's magnified in its NPK value. So they're, they're probably one of the simplest indicators of good soils that we can get. And again, just, uh, talking to John Gary Elliott, there's TAMS grants available for purchase of spades now from this year onwards. So here, Sean Midlin said last night, uh, I hope there's no any uh, porn on, on, on the slides. And I said, well, actually, I do. So there's, this is winder. This is tinder for worms. So there's, there's two worms getting... getting, getting. So, you, you, you know, you want to encourage that. You want to encourage that, right? Now, here's North County Dublin farm, a very low organic matter. 2%, which is very, very low. Compost applied in autumn 2018. We've been on for a number of years about applying a bit of compost. And eventually, we, we got them to, to look into it. Look at the mushrooms starting to appear. Look, look at the air pumps. He said he's never seen as many air pumps. This is over a couple of months. And again, source of food for microbes. Do you see the white fuzzy stuff on that straw breaking down that residue? So it's, it's, it's all good stuff. Balance is the key. So what's going to drive this? I'm coming to the end of it. What's going to drive the success of biological farming? Yeah, scientific data will. But at the moment, scientific data is probably about 15, 20 years behind the farmers and the good, the good pioneers. And there's a few of them in the room here today. Farmers, I think farmers are going to have to stand up here and be counted a bit. Because what will happen with biological farming is the government's going to take it over for their own agenda. So farmers have to get out there and understand why they should do it. Food truth, I think, is going to become vital in the next few years. Because if people knew what was happening with food, I'm telling you there'd be a, a, a war. I don't know whether you can see that there. Anyone see that? The Duchess at home, every so often I do make her dinner. And she loves bacon and cabbage. So that's lovely Irish cabbage. And when I went, so I, I was doing it, that's how I know. Cut it open, went to wash it, and there's my little blue slug pellet in there. That's not good, folks. And, and in some cases, farmers have been driven to that because the supermarkets want the perfect this, the perfect that, and blah, blah, blah. So consumer awareness is going to be far more important. Who's this, you know, people talk about sustainability. It's a word that drives me bananas. Who's it for? Well, look, at the minute, this is the way it looks. Government, environment, consumer, supermarkets, farmer. This is the way it should look. The farmer can drive it all. The farmer's in charge of sustainability. The farms, the farms producing this food. Now, sometimes we need to really turn things on their head to see reality. And I think that's probably one of the key messages today. Leave in here. Just try something different. Uh, embrace something a little bit different. If this was reality, farmers would be farming in the green, not the red. And that's a, a statement that's been used over the last number of years at, at different conf conferences. And the reason I say that to you, and some, what I would say about some of the research, the, the government at the moment are going to have to, ha you know, they have an angle on what they need to do for climate change, which has nothing to do with making farmers profitable. Absolutely nothing. It's actually them meeting their climate change obligations. Innovation and research is something I think we definitely need to look at as well. Uh, Fiona's definitely a step in the right direction there. And, uh, you know, I, I've travelled a bit around the world, and I'm hoping to do a bit more of that in the next year or two. But in a, you know, just Dwayne Beck in the Dakota Lakes Research Centre in, in, in America has been a revelation to me. Gary Zimmer, Neil Kinsey, there's plenty of others out there. All game, you know, we stand on the shoulders of giants. There's a little pub in RD called Benny Anderson. Some of the people here today will know it. And I, I, Benny's 86. And I went into him and I said, Benny, I met a relation of yours in America. And he said, all oh, right, right, we have cousins over there. I said, do you know how I knew he was a relation of yours, Benny? And he said, no, he said, his name was Randy Anderson. So I said, I said, they had the courage to call them the right names, Benny. You, you pick names. But anyway, Benny took a good laugh at it, right? But Randy Anderson is a USDA weed ecologist. And I tell you, you, wanna, you, you look at some of the research work he's putting out. It is phenomenal. And it is definitely spun around thinking or upside down thinking. Come back to the Dakota Lakes, folks. Farmers own that research station. Farmers own it. Now, Dwayne Beck is a sort of what we call in County Loud a humpy whore. You won't push him, you won't pull him. And in fairness to him, it was good. It's a good mix. 
The farmers own it, but they don't tell them what to do. But the, the basics of that research is to make farmers more profitable and do it in an environmentally friendly fashion. Jonathan Lundgren, he spoke at a conference with us a number of years ago, and again in Carlingford. Some brilliant stuff coming out from himself at the moment. Worth a look. Uh, farmers are strong st stakeholders. We need to be stronger. You need to go talk to people like Fiona and, and, and see what Fiona's trying to achieve and where it fits in with you and can you drive it, can you look at something slightly different. Biomimicry is, 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 is again, copy nature, she knows best. No Till on the Plains was the conference I met those guys at. So, look, we'll wrap it up with that. Uh, I suppose we'll, we'll leave that one up just to let you have a wee think about it.